for and also to and also to the uh, Minerva Lab for hosting this. So welcome everybody to the second online lecture of uh, this TV's Gender Studies Network. Um, as you may know, today we have our, our guest is Professor Marion Müller. I will talk a little bit uh, more about Professor Müller and then she will start the presentation. So uh, Marion Müller has studied sociology, political science and cultural anthropology at the University of Mainz. She worked as a researcher at the University of Mainz and later also as a researcher at the um, Bielefeld University. This is where she actually conducted her dissertation and her dissertation was within the sociology of the body and sport. And it was about football uh, and um, she got like many prizes for her dissertation, for example, the dissertation award for the German of the German Sociological Association. Uh, afterwards, she was a junior professor um, at the University uh, Trier and she then finally got a professorship um, uh, of sociology with focus on gender studies at the University of Tübingen in 2016. So we are very happy to have her at the University of Tübingen. Her current research topics are, um, for example, sociology of human differentiation. This is like maybe one of the, the, the talks that you will hear today falls kind of in this uh, research interest. Then also sociology of the body and sport and interaction sociology, where I heard there is a book upcoming. I hope this will we will uh, hear about that more uh, very soon. Um, and the sociology of world society and globalization. Um, her latest funded projects were Making Up People in World Society, Analyzing the Institutionalization of Global Social Categories and Gender, difference, uh, gender Differences in Key Transition Phases in Family Life. Um, today, we will be hearing a talk, um, the talk dealing with disrespect, how women attribute experiences of unequal treatment. Um, I will give uh, the word now to Marion and uh, later after the talk, please feel free also already during the talk to pose your questions in the chat and I will then uh, read them out loud. So um, um, Professor Müller, Marion Müller, please um, feel free to start with your talk. Yes, thank you very much. Can all of you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this uh, uh, nice introduction. And I would like uh, to present today some uh, more exploratory thoughts. So it's no completed research project, but more an idea for further research. And I'm very interested in your opinion about it. Um, but I already have collected some data during the past three semesters with some of my master's students um, in a teaching research project. Um, and I already spotted some of them in the audience. Okay, the subject of my talk are situations of disrespect and marginalization, or more precisely, it's about discrimination. Um, so at first, we need to talk about what is meant when it comes to discrimination. So although I guess that most of you have quite a clear idea um, of what discrimination is, usually discrimination is defined as an illegitimate or unjust equal treatment or a disadvantage of persons on the grounds of their membership in certain categories of persons. So like, for example, ethnicity, age, gender, um, or disability. So obviously there are at least two components of a discrimination, an unequal treatment, which is perceived as illegitimate. And the reason of this treatment needs to be the belonging to a certain category. Um, and I think in most cases, individuals who belong to a stigmatized group know quite clearly when they are experiencing disrespect um, or discrimination. So um, here is one example, um, a short description of a situation. Um, I read it out. So Isabel has successfully completed uh, her apprenticeship and is asked by her boss to attend a job interview. During the interview, her boss points out that he has heard that she stopped taking birth control pills in order to get pregnant. 
he tells her that he has nothing against family planning, but considers the timing right after the apprenticeship to be unwise. So he decides not to continue employing her. So I think this is undoubtedly an unequal treatment. Isabel is deprived um, from getting this job. Um, and the reason for this decision is also quite obvious. By talking about family planning and birth control, Isabel's boss addresses her as, um, as a woman. And because in our society, family and career are um, incompatible only for women. So, and she does not get the job because she is a woman, I think it's clear. But besides this kind of incident, um, there are a lot more ambiguous situations when the reason for a certain behavior is not obvious, respectively, there could be other grounds for discrimination. So maybe uh, I've changed the situation a little bit. Um, Isabel has successfully completed her apprenticeship and is asked by her boss, to attend a job interview. The interview goes smoothly. The boss does not ask about her family planning. In the end, however, Isabel does not get the job. So the question is, is this discrimination? I assume if we don't know the motive of the boss, it depends on Isabel's perception of the situation. She has to make sense of her boss's decision and only if she feels unequally treated and sees the reasons for this um, in her gender, um, I think then it is discrimination. But it is also possible that she doesn't see any connection between his decision and her being a woman of uh, um, a woman in reproductive age and who may soon have children or something like that. And then I think it's not so clear whether it is discrimination or not. <clears throat> We can see in order for an action to become perceived as a discrimination, certain assignment processes um, are required. And these assignment processes, um, they have their origin, at least I think they have their origin, in certain collective stocks of knowledge. And there has to be a whole series of interpretative processes um, through which an unequal treatment becomes discrimination in the first place. And these processes, it is, I'm interested in. So the questions are how to know to which ground to assign an unequal treatment. People usually have multiple belongings. They, they are women of a certain age um, with a certain color of skin. Maybe they have an impairment and so on. So which of your different characteristics or memberships should be taken into account as explanation for certain kind of behavior. And what factors do influence one's sense-making processes of experience these unequal treatment? <clears throat> and maybe another uh, question, um, uh, what factors make one interpretation more likely than another? Yes, these are the questions I'm dealing with today. And I want to stress that I'm um, not interested in the subjective processes of mind, the intra, intra psychic um, processes, but as sociologists, um, um, the sense making processes need to be communicated and make social recognizable. And another remark in advance, um, please. Do not misunderstand this in the sense that it is about denying the members of marginalized groups um, are discriminated against. I'm more concerned with the question of the conditions under which they are able to recognize this and, and to create plausibility in a way that is um, also comprehensible to others, um, these situations of discrimination. Okay, after this long introduction, sorry um, for that, but uh, I think it's, it's a little bit complicated. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, I start by describing briefly some of the sociological research on discrimination and try to find an appropriate defini definition. And I also want to say um, some words about the grounds for discrimination, for example, um, gender, race, and so on. And next I... Um, present some empirical data, interviews with, with women who tell about situations when they experience disrespect or felt treated unequally. And at the end, I, yes, I summarize some of, of the results and um, 
and uh, want to tell you about uh, ideas for further research. Okay, I would like to start by briefly reminding you that all of our lives consist to a very large extent of unequal treatment and that without anyone getting upset about it. So it is normal that we are treated unequally every day and also that we treat other people unequally ourselves, for example. <clears throat> yes, while you freak out with joy um, over a scribbled picture of your two-year-old son, no one would probably want a qualitatively similar picture painted by me. Or, well, it's completely okay for the members of your family to come into your home, look into the fridge and ask what's for dinner, you would not tolerate the same behavior from the postman or something like that. And another example, none of us, or at least I think none of us um, complain that a teacher earns more money than a cashier in the supermarket. So these examples teach us that unequal treatment is usually not a problem. It is perceived, if it's perceived as legitimate, um, if there are valid, comprehensible reasons for it. So if you're related to, um, to these persons or you will treat them differently or um, you will get better payment if you have a higher education degree and so on. So unequal treatment or being deprived of resources becomes only a problem if the reason for this treatment is not based on differences like the one I told, but on membership of a particular group. Such treatment contradicts fundamental norms of equality and justice that are part of the self-image or the, the self-description um, of modern society. Um, and I think most people would probably agree with the statement that people should not be treated differently because of their gender, color, or ethnic origin. So um, this uh, belongs to the um, non-discrimination principle that is already stated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights from 1948. And here you can read it. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this decla declaration without distinction of any kind, such as, uh, as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. So here we find a list um, of the prohibited grounds of discrimination. And all of them are understood in terms of everyday theory as um, person characteristics. That mean that as something, they are understood as something that is inherent to an individual. But from a sociological point of view, sex, gender, race, and so on, um, they are not simply given characteristics, but they are the result of um, complex interactive construction processes, which have to be accomplished by the people involved. <clears throat> so we have to bear in mind that there aren't just men and women or people of color or white people, but all of us have to do, we have to accomplish um, our gender, their gender, our race, their race, ethnic origin, and so on. And by doing, I mean, we are performing these categories and they are attributed to us by others. And of course, we are attributing the belongings to others too. So this doing gender or doing race has to be um, also part of being discriminated against. At first, the person who is deprived, um, another one, of getting access to an opportunity because of their gender has to attribute a gender to them. And then the person affected has to do the same. So recognizing discrimination includes also the accomplishment of gender or race or whatever form of um, belonging is made accountable for. Uh, yeah, in uh, traditional inequality research usually um, does not take um, this into account. Instead, um, usually they do something like that. The income or education degrees are correlated with these characteristics, and um, they are treated. These characteristics are treated as as innate features, um, just as in in an everyday world perspective. Um, and there is also another way to survey discrimination. Um, uh, 
That is just to ask whether one has ever experienced discrimination because of their gender or ethnicity and just to count the number of people who say, yes, this is another way um, uh, like this, like the research is done. But the sociology of inequality is usually not interested in asking how people identify um, an incident of unequal treatment as discrimination and how they recognize the reasons for its stigmatization, if it's not expl explicitly told. And um, they are also not interested in where this knowledge comes from. If at all, there are um, studies from social psychology about um, the subjective perspect um, per perception of, of um, discrimination and these inherent assignment processes, but they are focused on the intrapsychic processes and um, uh, that one I'm not interested in uh, because I think they have to be communicated and um, you have to be possible to, it has to be possible to observe them. So in my considerations, um, I follow on from, uh, from work by Michelle Lamont about racist discrimination. And like her, I assume that the attribution of unequal treatment to uh, certain memberships always takes place against the background of existing cultural repertoires. That means that individuals make use of existing tools in a society to understand uh, what is going on um, and what is the reason for an unequal treatment. And at the center of these repertoires, um, are the rights and demands of um, different collective actors for inclusion um, that are considered as legitimate in a certain culture. And um, it also includes the political identities and uh, ideologies of emancipation um, that go with them. So in the next section, I will present some um, data from interviews with women who we asked if they had ever been treated unfairly and um, they were asked to describe the situations. The interviews were conducted by um, master students as part of a teaching research project at the Department of Sociology um, at the University of Tübingen. And I think some of the students are also with us and um, maybe they can tell us about it. The interviews were conducted in German, so I had to translate them uh, for this talk. And the names of the persons, of course, were replaced. Ooh. In the following, I will use um, the term discrimination in the following sense. This is uh, very similar to a definition um, of Michel Lamont. Discrimination refers to incidents in which people believe they were deprived or prevented from getting access to opportunities and resources due to their race, ethnicity, or gender. And because discrimination generally goes hand in hand with feeling stigmatized um, or being assigned a low status, I will also talk about stigmatization. And that means um, or includes a wide range of subjective experiences namely incidents in which respondents experience disrespect and their dignity, honor, relative, relative status or sense of self was challenged. And um, this occurs when one is insulted, receives poor services, is a victim of jokes, is subjected to double standard, standards, is excluded, is excluded from informal networks, is the victim of physical assault or is threatened physically. It also includes instances where one is stereotyped or where one is misunderstood or underestimated. So just to be clear um, with the terms. The first excerpt um, comes from an interview with the young women of Turkish origin. Um, I have called her Ayla. Ayla is 28 years old, bo born in Germany, but her parents are from Turkey. At the time of the interview, she um, was completing her doctorate in a natural science subject um, at a German university. And she told, uh, told us about an incident during her school days. Um, she went to a secondary school, um, Realschule, is it called in German? That's a kind of junior high school uh, for 
for, for children from 10 to 16, um, where you can make um, uh, this mittlere Reife um, is kind of intermediate school certificate. Um, so, and together with their teacher, the students made a trip to, to the job center to get information about professions and apprenticeships. And um, then she told us this story about this excursion. I read it out. Now, the best example would be then, um, would be in the secondary school time when we had to go to then to the employment agency with the whole class, have to spend the day there. There you could look at apprenticeships and other professions. Now I must say, I always, I have always been a very good student. And there I am then, I knew even then that I would like to go in this direction, which I do now, in the direction of biology and chemistry. And also would like to study, and therefore I went to the section where the academic professions were. And then my teacher came to me that said, Ayla, stay realistic and go back to the apprentice occupations. And to say that to a top student, I think it's unequal treatment because she did not say that to other students who are clearly doing worse in school than I am. So um, looking back from her current position as a doctoral student, um, Ayla feels unfairly treated by her teacher. Um, and initially in, in this expert, uh, she refers to her good performance at school. Um, and this is the background against which the teacher's comment seems incomprehensible to her and inappropriate. However, we do not learn why the teacher considers it unrealistic that Isla um, could study. Since Isla has the necessary school qualifications, she has good grades. Um, one wonders what the hint to stay realistic um, refers to. And Ayla describes her interpretation of the situation in, um, in a further part of the, of the interview. <clears throat> Which, uh, you can read here. Of course, I was shocked at first and didn't understand why it was like that. At that time, I wasn't as self-confident as I am today. So I kept quiet and talked to my parents about it, who of course supported me very much and said, she's crazy, uh, the teacher is crazy. And I don't know what she was thinking because exactly I had her in three courses and I got an A in all three courses. So um, it wasn't understandable. So in this situation at that time, Isla, um, was not able to ask the teacher or what the teacher meant, um, but responded uh, with shame. Only in the um, interaction or um, through discussing the situation with her parents, she was able to make sense of the teacher's statement and made the person of the teacher as an individual accountable for it, not saying that she's crazy. And Later on in the interview, after further questioning, um, Ayla presents a different interpretation of the situation, which she has apparently only developed several years later. And now she says, well, that tended more towards racism because she, as a man is the teacher, well, that's a subjective opinion because she, well, that wasn't the first time, but, but she has, already treated foreigners, that is those with a migration background differently than here. That is German students, for example. So you can recognize um, that the interpretation of her teacher's comment as racist comes not easy to Isla. She needs some start up um, and gives a lot of explanations and justifications. And um, she still stays quite vague in this explanation and it's hard to say what is meant by her reference to a different treatment of foreign students because it cannot refer to a disadvantage in grading. She had already said that she had A's in all subjects uh, with the teacher in question. So, and moreover, it's um, only many years later in retrospect and from a different position in her life, so to speak, that she comes up with this explanation. So. Why does it seem to her retrospectively sensible to account for her ethnic origin? And please don't, um, don't misunderstand me. I do not doubt her explanation. 
and we don't know what the teacher at that time really meant and um, it doesn't matter uh, for our question here but i want to ask why does she choose to make this attribution now and another thing um is i think it is quite interesting that it does not even occur to her to assign the teacher's comment to her gender Isla does not seem to think for a moment that her teacher's remark might not, or at least not only, has referred um, to her Turkish origin, but also to the fact that she's a girl, and therefore more likely to pursue a career as, um, as a wife or mother um, than as a university student. But instead, her migration background seems to have a greater explanatory power to her from her current point of view in her life course. And I think uh, we can assume that she had, has had further experiences of a racist discrimination since then, and now also interprets um, past experiences accordingly. But there are also two additional um, possible explanations. Maybe we can assume uh, that in Germany, gender differences, at least at her age, 28, um, are no major inequality factor. Uh, she's not married yet or has any children. Therefore, experiencing gender inequality um, is yet to come. And another explanation would be the comparatively weak feminist movement in Germany. In public coverage, feminism is not nearly as popular as the anti-racist um, movement. Okay, now I would like, I, I, at least very briefly pre present um, another case. Um, this is the case of Maria, uh, she, or let's call her Maria. She's a woman 40 years old, has two children. She comes not from Germany, but from another European country. Uh, she has a PhD and a Vigna Legendi in a natural science sub subject and is employed as um, an academische Rätin um, at a German university. An academische Rätin, that's a title for an office holder. Um, maybe, uh, I don't know an English word for it, maybe it's similar to, um, to assistant professor. Um, yeah, so the situation uh, she told us about is that she applied for an appointment as APL professor. APL professor, that's a kind of extraordinary professorship without a chair and without any research assistant. And uh, she applied for this APL professorship at the same time with a male colleague. Okay, and now uh, she told us, we both, um, <clears throat> her colleague and, and, and uh, she, habilitated in January of this year. And then both of our cases were discussed in the faculty council meeting. And uh, the problem is that the criteria are not clear. Our two, two cases are exactly the same on paper, but then the meeting came and they voted for him first and many abstained. And then in the end, he was appointed APL professor by a majority vote. After that, it was my turn and I got a no. Well, um, there I feel, I feel unequally treated. I can't say whether it was because of my gender or because I'm not from Germany. And in the further uh, course of the interview, she explained the circumstances in more detail, um, how it came about. So she told us that after habilitation, one usually has to wait two years before applying for an APL professorship. But then she, um, she heard that her colleague had applied and so she applied too. <clears throat> and uh, then I, I got emails from, yes, with pushbacks. No, don't do that. It doesn't work because it's too fast. Wait a bit. And I wanted to know why do I have to wait? But he doesn't. But they couldn't really say that. Never. 15 minutes before the faculty meeting, I got an email from the faculty spokesman. He said, please, wouldn't you better not do it? So that's bullying. And he didn't. He her colleague, he didn't get this pushback. He always had a little push. I had a little pushback all the time. And I pushed for both of us. And I did meetings with the faculty spokesman for both of us. Anyway, in the end, someone thought, no, she should wait a bit. And that's why, yes, I have the impression it has to do with gender. That's the only thing that's not the same, that I am a woman, he is a man. 
and he's He's from Germany, I'm not. So you can see Mariah, uh, she struggles making sense of the whole situation and um, the voting research. She tries to understand her experiences um, at the German university, but it is difficult for someone who has not been socialized in the German university system. So she is lacking insider knowledge and um, on how to prepare certain um, career moves at a German university or maybe even at this particular university. And uh, she's also aware um, that she don't know how to do this. So, and this is um, also, I think this is also the reason why she is insecure what to claim her defeat on. Is it because she's a woman or because she's not from Germany? And in the um, Later in the interview, um, she searches for additional possibilities and her considerations seem to condense toward gender. She refers to both her experience at the, um, her current university and the experience of, uh, of those around her. And she compares um, these experiences with other countries and comes to the conclusion that women in Germany are much more strongly defined by their, by their roles as mothers, um, uh, yeah, and ultimately she attributes this experience to her gender and her lack of connection um, in her faculty. So I, now I come to the conclusion. We looked at, um, at these two situations or incidents in which people believe they were deprived of prevented from getting access to um, certain opportunities and resources due to their belonging to, um, to a category of person um, such as uh, ethnicity or gender. The starting point was the question how um, the affected persons made sense of such a treatment um, if it's not made explicit and how they attribute it to a particular characteristic of their own. So this is not about direct and open forms of discrimination, um, but about more ambiguous and disguised situations. The focus of this talk was the uncertainty of the affected people to find appropriate and comprehensible interpretations for such incidents. So this is about, um, at the end, I think it's about defining reality and confirming these definitions of reality. But what reality is or is perceived as such is sometimes not so sure um, and can change during your own course of life. Another, uh, if you think of Didier Eribon, for example, he has long interpreted his own life story primarily from the perspective of a gay man and he understood his sexual orientation as the crucial criterion. And only after the death of his father and his uh, return to Rhin um, did he come up with the insight of explaining his experiences also as a result of his social background. But now to, to, the, to both of the cases I presented before. I think the most important difference between those two cases um, are the social consequences. While Maria was actually denied access to, um, to certain resources, Ayla's case is more about being evaluated or stigmatized. The teacher's comment didn't stop her actually from studying, but Maria didn't get uh, the RPL professorship. And nevertheless, there are um, more similarities between the cases. We saw in both cases, that, um, that the women struggled to make sense of their experiences. Both of them had to talk to other people to understand what had happened or um, to corroborate their, um, their interpretation of reality. Ayla had to ask her parents and Mariah um, talked to her husband. Uh, and he's also a professor in her subject. Um, I didn't, I didn't uh, tell you that. So, I think this is the first result, the attribution and interpretation processes that are part of discriminating in these uh, discriminating incidents 
are intersubjective and are the results of negotiations with other people, more trusted people like family members or good friends or something like that. And the second result um, is that how people were making sense of their experiences depend on their former experiences and, um, and knowledge. And these are the these uh, cultural repertoires. Only through a certain kind of background knowledge, the affected persons classify an experience and make sense of what happened. Um, and at the same time, it also makes certain explanations more plausible and obvious than others. And these cultural repertoires can also vary according to age and uh, your position in society. When Ayla, the, in the first case, she experienced the, um, the incident with her teacher, she was very young and hadn't had enough knowledge and experiences to make sense of her teacher's comment. And obviously her parents, either um, they didn't know any better or they wanted to help their daughter by declaring the teacher crazy, we don't know. Um, but 15 years later, however, and against the background of numerous other experiences of discrimination, and also um, an increasingly prominent anti-racist movement, uh, for example, Black Lives Matters, and so on, Ayla recognizes this incident retrospectively as a racial discrimination. That she doesn't get the idea to attribute the comment to her gender is probably due to her age. She hasn't had any children yet and probably hasn't experienced much um, deprivation as a woman. And the fact there's no, um, yeah, I also that there's no particular strong feminist movement in Germany, I think that's also um, uh, important, an important background. In contrast, Mar Mariah, she comes from a country with a traditionally very strong feminist movement. Um, and as a young full-time working mother in Germany, she's already experienced resentment. So in her case, attributing her rejection to her gender uh, is uh, the most plausible approach or is more plausible um, than to attribute it to, to her ethnicity. Yes, and then here are some thoughts um, about further research questions. I think very, um, important question is uh, what are the most relevant factors for making sense of incidents like this and and when in the life course? I, I think the life course is, uh, is also a very important part of this explanation. And I assume that gender gets more relevant the older a woman is, um, but I don't know. And I assume that in Germany, women with a migration background, especially uh, young women like Ayla will make sense um, of unequal treatment more likely with their ethnic origin than their gender. But also, again, to find out would be the, uh, a task for further research. And finally, most people seem to make sense of such incidents by attributing it to only um, one single belonging. While sociologists um, since the 1990s uh, try to study multiple simultaneous differences, uh, they are talking uh, about um, intersectionality. Um, and we all know that most people in everyday life, um, they, they don't feel as part of uh, this, this simultaneously of different uh, belongings, but they think of themselves uh, just as, um, uh, as uh, or they highlight um, a special identity or just one identity. Um, of themselves and apparently grounding discriminations um, in terms of only one social membership generates, I think, um, more plausibility um, than referring to the interference um, of several categories or the, the simultaneity of, um, of several categories. And I'm, uh, yes, I'm also wondering why this is so. So I think I'm at the end. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I'm very interested in your opinion and comments. Thank you, Marion. Thank you so much for this uh, very, very, very fascinating talks. I'm uh, talk. I'm very, very um, curious about the questions that people have. Um, 
yeah, thank you for for um, opening the floor. Also, like in a um, on Zoom here. So I actually was wondering. Uh, of course, you can imagine. I I would be interested in an intersectional approach. <laughs> so I was like, ah, yeah, this is actually. Uh, why did you? Uh, so so uh, actually, it's it's two things that that I found very interesting. So. First, that they I can I can imagine that they only they, they rather um, chose one category to um, frame the discrimination. Could you think of an example or of a scenario where somebody would maybe not do that? So I was imagining like maybe some feminist scholar who has uh, had uh, done like some um, theor uh, theoretical courses in intersectionality. Um, could you think about that? And and what would you think um, is the um, yeah actually the the advantage um, also of of having a closer look at this at this rather mo like monofocal look at at one category and how they talk about that um, versus having a look at them uh, at the um, intersectional of categories because for example Didier Eribon I would say of course he's he's focusing on class but I would say that he's also combining it sort of with uh, sexual orientation so that would yeah. be an example for combination yeah, I, I think so but um I can't remember any case in in um in our sample where someone uh, maybe uh only Maria, she was the one um, who actually she talked about two reasons or two possible um, um, ways to to make sense or to frame um, uh, her 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 situation, um, and she was referring to gender or and to her not coming from Germany. So it's not about her ethnicity, but it's more about her not being. Um, uh, not to know about the the, uh, the certain ways how to behave or how, how to make these career moves in a in a university. Um, uh, but I can't remember any any other case um, where the people were referring to uh, to two or maybe more um, of their belongings. Maybe one of the students can remember. I, I don't want to say um, anything wrong and. They know most of the data better than I do, um, but um, I'm not aware of any of this. Yes, it, why this is so, um, I'm not sure. Yes, I think maybe in, in everyday life, most of, um, most of us just think about themselves. Um, most, mostly, um, or during certain periods of life, um, uh, as as a woman, or then in another period of life, or in another context, maybe it's more um, context specific, or something like that. Um, yeah, that's a question from Ingrid. Oh yeah, yeah. Maybe Marion, I should ask my question because I think my no, I my chat it. is rather cryptic. <laughs> um, uh, thank you for this talk because what it made me understand immediately is how discrimination is in fact, if you like, a, a battleground actually also of the assignment of meanings and intentions, right? So that a battleground of, on the one hand, deniability, right? No, I didn't say this, this was not what I meant. No, mm -hmm. blah, 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 right? We know all this, right? And of this ambiguation, right? Of, of needing to somehow convince someone uh, that a particular explanation actually makes sense, right? Rather than another explanation, right? This is because of my gender and not because I have big feet, right? Or whatever, right? Um, so I'm not being paranoid, which would be which would be feeling that I'm being treated unequally without having been assigned to a particular legitimate group, right? Um, so I'm being I'm being dis I'm, I'm being I don't know discriminated against because I'm a neighbor or something like this, right? That won't work, right? So it has to be a group. So disambiguation on the one hand as a necessity to, to assert what's been happening and deniability then of course on the part of those who want to say that nothing's been happening. Um, and, um, and I wonder whether what you've observed might not be a function of that, right? That handling two or more categories 
in this kind of battle for meaning, right, um, would actually not be helpful, right? Because for on the one hand, it would make things even more complex. It would certainly enhance the possibilities for deniability, right? If you can't even be sure what exactly I've been discriminating against, you know, how can you be sure that I've been discriminating at all, right? Uh, so that I think that there must be a necessity for certainty in these negotiations, right? That 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 seems to work anti anti intersectionally uh, in a surprising sort of way. Uh, do you think that I'm on the right track? Um, and uh, or not? You can say, of course, no. I'm, I'm not a sociologist, so I won't be insulted, right? Um, and where would that lead us, right? Where would that uh, where would that take us? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I think you're all on the right track, and. Um, I think uh, you could recognize um, that these questions of discrimination, it's uh, mostly about, or, or a great part of it is about um, acknowledging uh, the definition of reality and acknowledging that um, uh, that people are discriminated against. And um, and this is also why I'm so interested in these um, in these uh, attribution processes, which usually uh, were not. Uh, research in sociology in, in sociology because they are yeah it's, it's very difficult uh, to get them it's very difficult to observe them it's very difficult uh, to talk about uh, to talk about it and um, without um, yes with without um, putting in question if it's right or, or or it's a very big problem not to get in this discussions. Uh, what's was this right? Was this wrong? What happened? What does really did really happen? Um, so and uh, no one of us can say what what really did happen. And I think that's not the question. But uh, it's uh, or maybe it's also it belongs also to to this uh, kind of personal battles or something like that. Um, yeah, but um, the. The most important part, I think, is um, for for kind of for for this kind of research, is to help people uh, to make uh, comprehensible to others that they are discriminated against, and and maybe also why it um, happened. And mm -hmm. yeah. And there are other questions, but I I can't read this. Yeah, Kat, uh, Katrina more. Blindo would like to ask the question herself, so I will let her. Yeah. <laughs> Talk. Yes, hello. Um, uh, thank you for the great um, presentation. And I, I want to say I'm very delighted um, that you're engaging in this research. Um, I'm uh, conducting a um, PhD about sexual harassment. And the field is full of all these speculations about um, measuring mistakes because it's so difficult to to get an objective measure of who has been sexually harassed, how to define it and um, who gets to determine it and so on. And there's, um, I think the field is ripe and the whole discrimination field is ripe for uh, some more qualitative research that really looks into the process where people themselves determine this. Um, I was wondering, um, now comes the question, <laughs> first the praise then, the, the actual content. Um, I was wondering um, about your Isla case. I was thinking because you're speculating about why she didn't activate the gender category more because she says it's a female teacher. I think women maybe don't really expect gender discrimination to, to an appropriate um, degree from other women. We still kind of have this imagination that it mostly comes from men or that discrimination always comes from the other. Like we, we are also having a bit of a difficulty acknowledging that people who are racialized themselves or marginalized themselves, you know, on grounds of ethnicity also are racist towards others and so on. We always think it's a privileged group discriminating against the other. Um, so I think people still have difficulties um, doing that. And the other thing is that this is very important in my research that I try to defend right now is that we also see the whole situation in the context. The same uh, behavior um, in a group with a different gender composition 
will not be experienced as problematic maybe as it would be you know being the the only woman around men is a completely different situation and all many men and all women will be aware of this than being a woman uh, 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 among three women and two men so i think um and then again in this isla um example you know it would be highly relevant for her if there were other girls going to the academic kind of section or if it was only only boys i think people are are much much more aware of of complex situations and they take it in immediately and they evaluate um other people's behavior based on the whole uh, situation it's not it's not one sentence that somebody said it's a specific person of a specific racial gender identity in a specific context you know we're aware of who else is witnessing it how i think that's it's the whole complex that goes into into yeah. the, um, the into the interpretation that's at least where i'm in the process i will have to write this up for my thesis so i'm very much in it right now um but um thank you very much i was talking a lot and um yeah just that's the thoughts that i would like to share to share yeah. based on the material yes and thank you very much uh that's a very good idea i i haven't thought about it um and but uh but also uh i i can't remember that isla um uh herself talked about it uh, or um that she that she did mention something about um the other girls or um whether there were other girls going with her to this section or something like that um uh yeah and i i uh, i haven't thought about it uh, about the the sex of the of the teacher um and uh, how this could be relevant but uh i think in in the case of maria maybe um this is a, another good explanation because i think i don't know exactly but i think she is the only or one of uh of very few women in her faculty uh, so i think um, maybe this is another reason why for her uh, gender is more comprehensible or um more uh, uh a better explanation for what happened thank you um irene seilinger has a comment and a question i will read out loud both cases you presented seemed quite clearly situations of discrimination and even here, the respondents needed to convince themselves that their uh, perception of injustice were illegitimate. Have you seen differences in how the respondents made sense of more ambiguous situations and gray zones? And could there be parallels to Liz Kelly's observation of women explaining away instances of threat of violence as nothing really happened? I start with the last one. Um, I can't remember that we have situations where women explaining things away. We, we had some of this um, of this uh, sexual harassment situations in in our first data, um, but not in the in the interviews. At the end, that was um, yeah. We had to think about why this uh, this doesn't come up. Maybe um, it was uh, because of the question and how the question um, was asked. Um, so no, the not really. And what was the first part? Um, have you seen differences in how the response made sense of more ambiguous situations and crazy zones? No, I think that was. Uh, we we only ask about ambiguous situations um, or um, where the, where no one explicitly uh, told what what the reason was. So we were only interested in these ambiguous situations, um, and there was all about gray all about these gray zones. Um, Okay, thank you. And then uh, one or two last questions from P. Alejandra Navarro. Um, wait. Um, she uh, the person writes the thing is I think we have to remember the issue of power and in this battle of meanings some groups have more power to determine the official discourse the discourse from which we'll do the interpretation of a particular scene or a scenario 
uh, in this way and following the question before, which factors can give the tools of resilience in some people, in the study, some women, to do a proper discourse from which they can visibilize for herself and their attribution process stigmatization involved in that experience? Yeah. I don't know, but I think this is a very important question, uh, which would be a kind of uh, follow up research or um, research in more deep, more deeply researching this, um, yeah. this topic. Yeah. Okay, one last comment of uh, Ingrid Hatz uh, Davies. Yeah, I'm going to explain. I, I just, um, I'm not very good at chat uh, writing. Um, I just want to make our lives more more difficult rather than easier because, you see, Ayla's example is not as clear cut as it might appear. She has a leaving certificate from a Realschule, therefore a Mittlere Reife, which doesn't give her access immediately to the university. So she would need to do it a, a, a further degree. So it is possible that the teacher actually discriminates against her on the basis of an assumption that uh, that children from uh, have, having that kind of schooling will never become professors, right? Which might be a discrimination on the base of, basis of class or of, edu of educational background. So, so that we, we, we would think, and in hindsight, Ayla thinks that, uh, that this woman told her that she had no business uh, uh, inquiring about study options because of who she is, right? But she could be saying this because of what kind of school she comes from. Mm -hmm. um, was this a reflection um, in, in terms of, I mean, what is the path that Ayla then took actually in real life, right? Did she then uh, um, Go to a special kind of, you know, Hochschule, or how how did how did she pursue her studies? That I can't remember, but maybe one of my students can remember um, how Ella uh, got to the university. But in the end, uh, she got her Abitur, and um, at the moment, she's making a, mm -hmm. um, a PhD in I can't remember uh, uh, chemistry or biology, maybe. Do you remember? No, it, it doesn't matter because I mean I think that it, this would still spell badly for the teacher, right? Because yeah. the teacher would still be someone who would limit their students' uh, ability to somehow develop into the future, right? Yeah, uh, but, but the you reason there would be a different one. Yeah, exactly. But um, uh, we already uh, we, we reflected about the possibility that the discrimination was about the class situation or, or social origin. Um, but uh, they chose they chose uh, the the this gray zone. Um, you don't know uh, why the teacher um, made this comment, and it's very difficult uh, to make sense um, mm -hmm. uh, what it was about. Um, if you she hadn't asked, and um, then retrospectively, there are very many upper, um, possibilities how to to make sense of the situation. Gender. Ethnicity, class, maybe uh, other things, I don't know. It's very difficult. Okay, so we're um, unfortunately running out of time. Uh, thank you for for your for uh, the presentation, uh, dear Marion, and also for all the questions and for answering the questions. Uh, I would like to conclude with the announcement of the next um, 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 CV's Gender Studies Lecture, which is on April 26. And it is Julie Papadaku from the University of Athens, Growing Up Queer in Contemporary Greece, Tactics of Everyday Life. So uh, please dial in again. Um, and I'm sure it will be a very interesting um, lecture also given um, by Julie. So uh, have a beautiful, wonderful evening and all the best and hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. See you next time. See you next time.